Welcome to the uh, Vocal Recording Masterclass. Today I'm going to show you uh, different techniques of recording vocals and we're going to discuss, of course, the different microphones, as you can see, but also considerations like the room that we're going to make the recording in, the different types of voice, yeah, are we, what, uh, what type of uh, a vocalist are we dealing with, and of course also the different types of music that you're dealing with. All these, uh, all these things, of course, uh, dictate the actual technique that we're going to be using uh, to record our vocal with. So first of all, I want to start talking about recording lead vocals. Hey, recording lead vocals, of course, is uh, a lead vocal is one of the most important tracks that you're going to have in your song most of the time. So we need to, uh, to, uh, to uh, look at that in depth as to uh, how we're going to do this. Now, first of all, the first uh, most important thing to think of is the type of voice we're going to be dealing with. Uh, so uh, so uh, clearly you have uh, uh, rock vocals that uh, uh, produce really high sound pressure levels uh, uh, versus uh, really soft, uh, perhaps female vocals that, uh, that uh, are a lot softer and more detailed sounding. And so uh, uh, completely different sound sources. Uh, there's also different types of music. So all these things can, uh, can help you determine uh, uh, how to record the lead vocal. Uh, in any case, what's important with a lead vocal is to, uh, to, to be aware of the fact that uh, the, the, the lead vocal has to be very focused. Hey, you want to the, the, the lead vocal typically uh, pretty forward in the mix. And, uh, and audible uh, with all of its intelligibility intact. And that means that, uh, that uh, uh, compared to, uh, to lots of other sound sources you might mix the vocal in with, uh, you want to, uh, to, uh, to minimize uh, reflections that you may get. And this is because, uh, because of two reasons. Because reflections, uh, as opposed to the direct sound, they uh, interfere with the sound in different ways. For instance, if we have uh, a reflection path that is a very short reflection path, then this short reflection path uh, will arrive at the microphone a little bit behind the direct sound and it will comb filter. And comb filtering is a sort of unnatural EQ effect that you will get uh, as, a, as a result of the time delay between, the, between the, the direct sound and the reflected sound. And of course, this artificial EQ is going to affect the vocal sound in an unnatural way and therefore something to be avoided. Longer reflections, they, uh, they tend not to comb filter as much, but they're more likely to sound like reverb. Yeah, and, so, and reverb, although in itself it doesn't harm the, 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 the vocal sound in the same way that comb filtering does, but of course what reverb does do, it does unfocus the sound to a certain extent. Yeah. So both comb filtering as well as reverb and ambient sound have to be minimized to a certain extent when recording lead vocals. Now, there's, there's various ways we can do this. Yeah, for instance, if, uh, if, um, if, we, uh, if we record a lead vocal, then, uh, then uh, uh, the, the most often used picker pattern is the cardioid picker pattern. The cardioid picker pattern is a picker pattern whereby the, the microphone, uh, this microphone here, for instance, is a cardioid microphone, is sensitive at the front and it rejects sound more from the sides and it completely rejects sounds from the back. And this allows us to point the microphone at the sound source, the, the, the vocalist in this, in this case, and sort of reject all the other reflections that otherwise could have caused comb filtering or an excess of, of, uh, of ambient reverb sound. So th that's the reason why a cardioid picker pattern is not the only, but for sure it's the, the most often used picker pattern that we use for lead vocal recording. Um, another way is uh, to consider here is the, the, the how you situate the microphone in the room itself. As you can see in this room, for instance, there are certain surfaces that are highly absorbive. absorbive. There's uh, uh, other uh, surfaces that are more reflective. So in any case, what you, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the microphone uh, sees the sound that you want and it sort of discriminates against the sound that you don't want. Yeah? So in a, room like, in a room like this, for instance, it would make sense to point the microphone towards an absorbing surface. Yeah? That means that if the, the vocalist is standing behind the absorbing surface, that all the sound yeah, that is coming towards the microphone is direct sound coming from the mouth of the singer flowing straight into the microphone. And in, uh, in, in effect, we've, uh, we've reduced the amount of reflections that might otherwise give too much comb filtering or too much reverb. 
So uh, first of all, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the microphones that we've got. We've got uh, quite a few of my uh, my favorite vocal microphones here. I'll, uh, I'll introduce them to you and I'll tell you a little bit about them. Here right in front of me is the world famous Shure SM58 vocal microphone. It's an industry standard microphone, very much so in live sound. It's cheap, it's reliable, it's uh, rugged um, and uh, um, it's, it's, it's a dynamic microphone, which means that uh, dynamic microphones, uh, uh, unless there's something wrong with them, they cannot distort. This is one huge big advantage that you have of dynamic microphones that you don't see, for instance, with capacitor microphones. Uh, dynamic microphones can deal with l uh, very high sound pressure levels and they are also very good at dealing with, with distorted sounds. They, uh, they, uh, they are, for instance, very good for uh, male rock vocals, especially when the, when the sound pressure level is up and people are screaming into the microphone. You'll find that an SM58 is, uh, is uh, perhaps giving you a much better result compared to the much more expensive of capacitor microphones. There are no electronics inside it. There's almost nothing what can go wrong with this microphone, which is why it's so good. Of course, these microphones are designed yeah, to, uh, to so that, that even at very high sound pressure levels, the diaphragm with the moving coil attached to it is still able to vibrate freely inside the body of the microphone, hence why there is no distortion. Yeah? So there's no amplifier inside, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great microphone for high pressure levels. Yeah? Now, um, there's also a downside to a, a dynamic microphone, and that is the reason that the diaphragm attached to the moving coil is quite heavy. Yeah? What that means is that, uh, that if you consider sound coming from a voice, of course there's lots and lots of frequencies. Eh? So uh, there's, a, there's a, the more powerful fundamental frequencies, that's the note that the singer is actually singing, but there's the also much more weaker upper harmonic and upper partial frequencies, which are uh, much uh, 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 weaker in terms of their amplitude. Now, it is those weaker frequencies, those weaker higher frequencies primarily, uh, that of course are less powerful and therefore less able to set that relatively heavy moving coil element into motion. Which basically means, in effect, yeah, that these dynamic microphones don't pick up the high end as well as the microphones that we'll discuss later, the capacitor microphones. So these microphones, they have a built-in what's called low-pass filter, meaning that the lower frequencies, they are picked up quite nicely, but it's the higher frequencies that are picked up not as well. So this is very important to be aware of, because if you're dealing with um, a, a certain sound, a certain voice, whereby the high end is really important, yeah, then you, s you, you understand that this might not be the microphone of your choice. Yeah? Yeah. However, if you're dealing with a vocalist that has lots of high end, somebody that screams a lot into the microphone, a screaming is a type of distortion, for one of a better words, has lots of high end in it already, in which case this microphone is perhaps is just the right type of microphone you would want to use for your project. Another consideration is this. Every physical body has its own resonant frequency, meaning that, uh, that, uh, that uh, just like, like a, 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 a glass or a cup, yeah, you can vibrate it at any frequency you like, yeah, but if you simply hit it, it tends to want to vibrate at a frequency of its own. This is called a natural frequency or a resonant frequency. Yeah. Now, it's the same with these microphones. So, uh, so uh, we can make the, the, the diaphragm and therefore the moving coil vibrate at any frequency that we like. Yeah. However, there is a certain frequency that it really prefers to vibrate at. You know? It turns out that with an SM58, the resonant frequency of the of the diaphragm itself is around four, five, or six kilohertz some, somewhere. So that is sort of in the in the sort of sibilance range of, of the human voices. That's the the, 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 the frequency range where that uh, that we hear when we produce sounds like S's and T's, the the sibilance sounds. And so uh, so uh, um, what we see if we look at the frequency characteristics of this SM58, we see that it is a fairly sort of flat response in the mid range, but then towards four, five. Uh, six kilohertz, we see a slight boost uh, where these frequencies are slightly, uh, 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 the, the microphone is slightly more sensitive for those frequencies. And then over six, seven kilohertz, that's when then the, the frequency response drops off really fast. Yeah. So, uh, so this is what, what you end up with is a really unusual looking frequency response. 
but uh, but it turns out, and this is one of the reasons why the SM58 is, is, is so popular, uh, despite that what's seeming imperfection, it turns out that that sibilance range is quite an important range to do with the intelligibility. Uh, intelligibility, uh, what I mean by that is how well you can hear the lyrical content. It turns out that that uh, that, uh, that that little lift uh, that I was just talking about, uh, the lift that is a, a, a direct result of the the natural frequency, helps the intelligibility. It helps uh, it helps the 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 actual words. The lyrical content come out better, especially when it's surrounded by lots of other powerful sound sources like distorted guitars. Yeah, so it is another reason why this microphone is so popular in rock music, for instance. Okay, the next microphone in line is another industry standard. Uh, this time, a, micro a, a pure studio microphone is the Neumann U87 Vocal Microphone. Now, this is a very special microphone. Um, it's a, a multi-purpose microphone, but it excels at uh, at vocal recordings, especially vocal recordings at close range. Um, so essentially, um, this is quite a complicated microphone because it really is not one microphone, but it's two microphones in one. We think of it as one microphone, but in reality this microphone does not have one diaphragm, but it has two diaphragms that, uh, that sit right uh, back to back at each other uh, in, in, in the middle of this, of this basket. So, uh, so what this construction allows us to do is that, uh, that uh, because we're dealing with two separate microphones that essentially by themselves are just, just like the 58 we early discussed earlier, cardioid microphones. And so uh, what we can do inside the microphone, uh, we can mix those two microphones together to one single output. And we can do that in different ways. And what I'm talking about here is the polar pattern. Uh, for instance, if you uh, select, which is pro pro probably what we'll end up doing today, if you select this microphone to be a cardioid, then essentially it's only the front diaphragm is engaged. The, 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 the rear diaphragm is completely taken out of circuit. If you, uh, if you uh, switch the microphone to omni, yeah, it doesn't become a pressure-operated omnidirectional microphone. No, it's cheating it a little bit. Because what's happening when you flick it to omni, essentially you have a a cardioid microphone looking towards the front and a cardioid microphone uh, looking towards the back. And by switching them to Omni, you simply merge these two, two, two signals together. Yeah. Um, now there's other options too. You can uh, sw switch it to figure of eight, yeah, which is exactly the same situation, but when we flick to figure of eight, then the rear diaphragm is flicked out of phase. So, uh, so, uh, so it's it's uh, it's it's a multi-diaphragm microphone that uh, that uh, that uh, in this case probably since we're doing vocals we're going to be uh, we're going to be stick to uh, to the the, the cardioid pickup pattern. Um, now another th important thing to uh, to uh, to remember about this microphone is that it's uh, it's uh, it's a large diaphragm microphone. A lot of people tend to think that large diaphragm microphones are better at picking up lower frequencies. Yeah, this is not so. The key is that uh, that uh, large diaphragm microphones they are not quite as precise as registering high frequencies. For a little bit the same reason as what we earlier discussed with the SM58, we talked about how with the 58, the diaphragm uh, with the moving coil mechanism attached to it is quite heavy. Yeah. Well, in, in a sort of similar sense, if you compare a large diaphragm to a small diaphragm, a large diaphragm by definition is a bit heavier too. Yeah. Uh, because of its increased mass, it's not as accurate at registering higher frequencies. Frequencies. This is important uh, when when uh, when we consider this for uh, vocals because uh, because um, one thing has become very popular in music production is to uh, to uh, to record vocal microphones at very close range. Yeah, the reason for that is that uh, that uh, that doesn't give you at all a natural sound because when you listen to normally to somebody speak or somebody sing, you're relatively quite quite far away from this person. Yeah, and and so it is very rarely that you have your ear next to somebody's mouth, which is essentially what you're doing if you stick a microphone in some in in, in front of somebody. Yeah, so uh, so. Um, the reason why large diaphragm microphones are so good at close proximity is simply because the higher frequencies are not picked up as, as truthfully as, for instance, a small diaphragm microphone would do. And this means that uh, if you use a large diaphragm microphone close to the sound source, if it's a voice, yeah, it means that you can get all the sort of beautiful, sexy detail without harshness. If you ever try to, to register a vocal at close proximity with a small diaphragm microphone, you'll find that the sound might be a lot more harsh. Yeah? So despite all the increased detail, you will also have increased harshness. 
I think the, the, the main reason why, why the majority of, of lead vocal recordings these days are done with li which large microphones is because it allows us to get real close, pick up all the sexy, for want of a better word, detail of the voice without it ever becoming harsh. That's what the large diaphragm does. One thing to be aware of, uh, no matter what picker pattern that you have, inside we're dealing with cardioid microphones, so directional microphones. And directional microphones, of course, they're great for what it is that we're going to talk about, but they also have a possible downside. And that possible downside is called the proximity effect. The very fact that a microphone is directional that comes at a price and that price is the proximity effect and the proximity effect is the, the effect that as you the sound source gets closer to the microphone then relatively hearing more low end yeah and moving further away from the microphone gives you a much more flat frequency response so that is the price that you pay for having a directional microphone so all these things we need to think of when, when we choose our, our microphone, when we choose our uh, large or small diaphragm microphone. With a large diaphragm microphone, you're more likely to be able to get closer to the sound source without it ever becoming harsh. But there is an increased proximity effect taking place. So all these things we need to, uh, need to be aware of. There's a few more things to say about uh, the U87, because yes, it is a very truthful signal, but it's also extremely weak. Yeah, so that's the reason why uh, why these microphones they have an amplifier built inside them, so that so that as the the signal, the very weak yet truthful signal, as it comes off the capacitor, it is immediately sent to an amplifier and made more powerful. So that way it can travel through um, uh, 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 meters and meters of uh, of microphone cable before it reaches the microphone preamplifier in the mixing desk, for instance. Yeah, so uh, so uh, so that's all very well. But this all comes at a price, you see, because uh, you can already see that compared to a dynamic microphone, there's a lot more going on in a capacitor microphone. There's a whole lots of it's full of electronics. It's uh, it's 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 much more sensitive, and uh, and uh, this means that uh, that uh, you can potentially run into trouble. And one of these one of these uh, one of these uh, potential problems you may uh, face is, is is distortion. Earlier I told you that dynamic microphones cannot distort, while capacitor microphones they can distort simply because they have an amplifier. And as you know, if you overload the amplifier, you can get distortion. Yeah. So that means that uh, that uh, that uh, compared to uh, typical dynamic microphones, capacitor microphones they are not so good at picking up ultra loud sound pressure levels. Yeah. So uh, so so typically you would use a capacitor microphone for sounds that are uh, that are uh, less loud essentially yeah um, uh, also sounds of course whereby it's more important to pick up the high end more truthful yeah so uh, so um uh, now there's a few things of course that you can do to help on some microphones for instance this uh, this u87 it does have a pad switch it has a men uh, minus 10 db pad switch uh, what it really does it's a, it's, a, it's a resistor so that the, the weak the, the signal coming off the capacitor before it flows into the amplifier goes through a resistor so it's turned down before the amplification takes place and that ensures that the amplifier itself cannot distort yeah now of course it's not an amplifier that you have have a control over uh, during a performance so once you set the, your pad switch to a certain setting then, then you have to stick with that for for the for the recording of course in my experience the u87 is a great vocal microphone because of all the capacitor microphones that I know that is really good at dealing with high sound pressure levels but in order to be safe uh, rather than sorry I always stick the pad in minus 10 dB to make sure that uh, if I don't know the singer if I don't know the situation uh, the last thing I want to do is like uh, oh please can you sing that again because we had some distortion that's why uh, if I do record with the U87 uh, I typically switch the pad in uh, knowing that uh, that uh, that uh, if I especially when I close mic it if they have the vocal nearby, uh, I otherwise might run into distortion problems. Here's another industry standard microphone, the AKG 414. Uh, like the U87, it's a very common, high quality studio uh, workhorse microphone. It, uh, it's based upon exactly the same principle, so exactly it's the same thing. Where you, you have not one microphone, but two microphones. You have the same uh, 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 mechanism that allows you to, to uh, switch between the different polar patterns. You have um, a, a similar high pass filter and you have a similar pad switching system. Uh, what's different is that you have two different pad settings, minus 10 and minus 20 dB, so, so theoretically you could use the AKG 414 on even louder sound sources before the amplifier starts to distort. And uh, this, the high pass filter has two settings, one for 75 Hz and one for 150 Hz. 
Okay, now we're coming to the real tasty stuff. So this is uh, this is uh, one of my very favorite microphones. Uh, is a Sony C37A microphone. It's uh, it's again very similar in principles. Uh, it's a capacitor microphone. It's a large diaphragm microphone. We can switch the the, the, the polar patterns. Um, although uh, the one big difference between uh, between this microphones and the uh, the 414 and the U87 we discussed earlier is the fact that uh, this microphone uh, has a, a valve or tube amplifier inside. So we earlier we spoke how it is uh, it, it is necessary for any capacitor microphone to have an amplifier inside the microphone itself, yeah. And that tube circuitry it's it's uh, the, the, the has the same job of uh, of uh, of making the signal stronger. Now the thing is, uh, as you may know, that tube or valve circuitry has a certain status in sound engineering, a certain sound. Uh, lots of people desire the tube sound because how it affects the signal. It may distort the signal in a very pleasant way. For instance, people talk about harmonic distortion. Uh, essentially what it means is that, uh, that uh, compared to uh, the, the, the much more modern microphones that we talked about earlier, this microphone may color the voice in a sort of unexpected, but uh, as we'll find out, probably a really good way. So it's, it's, it's perhaps less truthful than a much more modern microphone, but it'll be surprisingly sexy sounding. This microphone came out uh, in 1952. It was the, uh, the 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 Japanese answer to uh, to the the, the world famous uh, Neumann U47 microphone. Um, so uh, so uh, uh, it became popular. I think it was Frank Sinatra who uh, once he sang in one of those microphones. Is the microphone he then uh, decided that was his personal favorite. And uh, uh, also Jimi Hendrix is another one that uh, that uh, that uh, did lots of recordings with this microphone. So uh, so uh, I'm very proud to uh, to uh, that this microphone is here, and uh, I can't wait to uh, to hear Sarah sing on it a little bit later. All right, here's another one of my vintage favorites, the Neumann U67. So uh, I believe uh, that this was the first uh, Neumann microphone that was actually designed for close miking. Uh, before that, you had the U47, which is an older microphone, uh, which was competing with this C37 that I just discussed. The thing about the U47 is an absolutely beautiful microphone, but it, in those days, uh, that uh, we, we, that was before the Beatles, before we had modern pop recordings. In those days, it was uh, it was not not common to have the microphone so close to the sound source. So, so the U47 was never designed as a, as a close uh, proximity microphone. Yeah. So this was the first microphone that had you know that possibility uh, for it meaning that uh, the uh, it dis doesn't distort as 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 quickly as a, as a U47 might have done uh, before that uh, like the uh, Sony it's also it uses valve circuitry so it has that similar sort of warm colored sound uh, it's not at all a natural sounding microphone but it is certainly enhances any vocal sound in in a spectacular way i could i, I couldn't choose between the two i love them uh, equally as much and uh, so uh, very often when i do vocal session uh, knowing that these microphones are so uh, fantastic I just uh, I just quickly choose between the two you know so I can't I can't wait for Sarah to to compare the two microphones and uh, and for you guys to uh, to uh, to listen to that all right, the last microphone in line is the, the Shups microphone. Uh, it's uh, the, from the Shups Colette series. It's a series of microphones that, uh, that whereby you can use different capsules. The capsule I'm using today is an MK4, which is the standard cardioid capsule. It's um, a small diaphragm microphone, so different from all the other ones before. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an extremely beautiful sounding microphone. It's very, very natural sounding microphone. It's a microphone that you would use perhaps in more classical situations. You would use this microphone uh, at a, a larger distance from the singer, whereby uh, you do not want things like proximity effect, whereby you do not have things like microphone technique. Uh, it's like the microphone is not supposed to be there. Those type of recordings, that's where this microphone excels at. So, uh, so typically uh, further away from the microphone, like I said earlier, because it is a small diaphragm microphone, if you get too close, it may start sounding harsh. Yeah, because of the the light weightness of the diaphragm, so it's a, it's a microphone that you would use at a at a at a larger distance from the from the sound source.